introduce. We'll be giving you an amazing talk. The uh, theme for our speeches this year is Training for a Revolution. And uh, you can look at our spoken word back stage back there. We have all sorts of uh, revolutionary slogans and sayings and all that sort of stuff. And we're here trying to grow and expand people's minds and uh, provide you with a venue to listen, to learn, and also to interact. So our speaker will be presenting, and then when he is ready, uh, you will look for me when you have questions. And feel free to wave me down, and I will bring the microphone to you, and you can interact with our speaker because interactivity is extreme. There's a man with a ball of ice in front of me. Are you going through the board right yeah, now? Are you going to give me a cold hand? Yeah. Ooh. Okay. Oh, thank you, sir. Excellent. All right, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker for the afternoon. His name is John Perry Barlow, and he is an uh, internet activist. He's been doing all sorts of stuff uh, for each and every one of us over the years. He's the co-founder and board member of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. He's a fellow emeritus at both Harvard's Institute of Politics and Berkman Center for Internet and Society. He's the past president of the Wyoming Outdoor Can Council, a practical anarchist, and probably most important, the father. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to give a nice warm welcome for Mr. John Perry Barlow. Alright. Check, 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 check. Yes, alright. Um, one of my modest objectives in life is to eliminate broadcast media. So I am not particularly interested in being a broadcast medium, and I'm going to say a few things, and then I want to have a conversation to the extent that that's possible, and I believe we will have a talking stick that can you know, circulate around the uh, audience, and we can go back and forth and uh, discuss. Uh, I would, I would guess that, at least on some level, everybody I'm looking at right now has a certain sympathy with anarchy. Right. Well, what I mostly want to talk about today, I mean, I, the title of this talk, for purposes of filling out the rather elaborate form necessary to become a speaker at Center Camp, uh, is governing the ungovernable. And, and another way of looking at this is practical anarchy. Uh, and I want to start out with a completely different set of experience bases. I come from Wyoming, which is a place notable for uh, a certain intolerance of government and an unwillingness to be governed. And, uh, you know, I was raised uh, with a set of standards about, about uh, the regulation of society that were based mostly on the Code of the West and, and generally not on rules and regulations and uh, had a natural affinity and and then after spending 20 years a cattle rancher I uh, I found myself weirdly thrust into a position very early on of being one of the people who started to think and write about what it was going to be like if the entire human race came into a single boundaryless condition called cyberspace, where there were no, none of the jurisdictional, uh, legal, and property-based methods that we had previously been using for governing ourselves. It's very difficult to make laws work when there are no bodies that can easily be found. And in addition, a few years, a few years after I'd been doing this, back in 1990, I started something called the Electronic Frontier Foundation. A couple of friends. And at first, we were taking a very uh, local view of the problem. We thought of the internet as being basically an American institution, since most people who were online at that point were Americans. And. Uh, we, we saw that the federal government was coming in, uh, well, in a, in a variety of ill-conceived ways uh, and trying to regulate this new zone uh, in a fairly freewheeling fashion because they didn't seem to think that the Constitution applied to this. 
and my colleagues uh, Mitch Capor and John Gilmore and I decided that the thing to do was to was to go to court and show them that the, that the First Amendment and the Fourth Amendment still applied in cyberspace, and, and we had some, some excellent early successes uh, and beat back some of the horde of, of insecure, well-armed people wandering around a place they didn't understand, uh, which I've never been comfortable with, uh, though you'll see plenty of it here today. Uh, and that was fine for a couple of years, and then at one point, I got an email from somebody, I guess it was less than a year, uh, in what was still the Soviet Union. Some kid had, had actually crawled across the Finnish border in order to send me this email. And he said, we, we understand that you're, you're protecting the First Amendment on the Internet. What about us? We don't have a First Amendment. And I had to realize that the First Amendment was a local ordinance in cyberspace. And that all of the systems that we had been using to assure rights were also not going to work very well. And I'd, I'd previously been thinking, oh great, this is a wild free frontier condition that will always be like this. Uh, but one of the problems with frontier conditions is that is that you do count on governments to protect you from the people who have no sense of your codes and no willingness to abide by your unwritten standards and don't necessarily belong to the same culture that you do. In the beginning, with the internet, it was really quite quite easy to maintain uh, what would be generally considered proper behavior because most people had the same sense of what that was. Moreover, and this was an important thing and is, is kind of relevant to what I want to talk about here today, uh, the internet was very pleasing to me because it seemed to be a working anarchy. There was nobody in charge, there could be nobody in charge. But as my colleague Mitch Capor pointed out to me, I, I, was, I was exulting over the fact that this was an anarchy at long last that worked. Uh, he said, well, it's been my observation that inside every working anarchy there's an old boy network. And indeed, there was. Uh, and the old boy network largely consisted of the Internet Engineering Task Force, and the laws that they were guided by were those of engineering. And it was, it was a very enlightened form of governance in the sense that elegance was the primary standard uh, by which things were judged. It was, a, it was to many degrees, a, a government of ideas and not of people. And engineers have a, an innate sense of elegance and what is going to be the most efficient solution. And moreover, the people that had started this thing, were we were blessed by them because they were people who, who were by their nature very uh, dedicated to the idea of openness of exchange of information freedom of expression and the ability of people anywhere to gain access to that. They had the same dream in the very beginning that I have always had since, which is that, that the internet becomes something where anybody anywhere can find out whatever they want to know that is generally useful to the advancement of humankind and that anybody anywhere can make that information available uh, and that there be as few restrictions whether by politics or by aggressive enforcement of the outmoded notion of copyright that uh, would stand in the way of that. One time I was, I was asking the guy who had, who had invented packet switch networking which was I mean, the, the internet didn't have a father, but it had a great many uncles, and he was one of the he was one of the leading uncles, a guy named Paul Barron, who had who had created the notion of packet switching at the Rand Corporation back in the early '60s. And I said, we're, "When you did this, were you trying to make certain that you could have a, a communications network that couldn't be decapitated by nuclear attack?" 
which had been the common belief. And he said, no, I was, I was trying to make a system that didn't have a head. And smiled slyly. And, and I found that kind of, of impish awareness of, of the importance of the mission uh, to be true with Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn and, and countless others that were, that were very instrumental along the way in creating the internet. But they were of a certain set class of, of people. And as the internet grew, as we all intended it to and, and expected that it would, it did increasingly start to have lots of people who didn't agree with the same set of standards about freedom of expression or the same standards about what, free, what, what expression ought to be freely expressed. Uh, and now, and, and, and moreover, for a long time, the internet was considered by most major institutions, certainly the government of the planet, uh, were not only clueless about the internet, they were dynamically anti-clueful, which turned out to be a blessing because they didn't try to do anything about it for a long time. I mean, at one point, I think it was about 95 or 96, I, I, I got a phone call from uh, Tom Daschle's office. The, the, he was then uh, minority leader of the Senate. And he said, I want to talk to you about uh, this cyberspace thing that you're on about. And I said, okay. So I, I came down to Washington and I expected to have a very pro forma meeting. And, and, and amazingly enough, the guy had a, he had an attention span much longer than an elevator ride and, and a capacity to listen that was kind of unprecedented in the Senate. And I talked to him for about an hour. And he said, finally, he said, what you're telling me is that the best thing we could do about this is nothing. And I said, that's correct. And he said, do you know how hard it is for us to do nothing? And I said, well, it looks easy to me. Uh, he said, well, I know, I, 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 get, I understand your point, but you know, it, it is very difficult to, for us to appear to do nothing about something that the, that the electorate regards as being something. And now they've started to think of this as something. And I said, well, I, you know, it's a difficult problem because I just can't, I can't imagine what you can do that won't be injurious. And he said, well, listen, here's, here's, here's what you might try. Why don't you recommend things that we could do that would look like something but won't actually be anything? <laughs> and he meant it. Uh, and so that, that actually worked fairly well for quite a while. Uh, but, you know... I knew, and I think anybody who thought about it knew, that part of what was going to happen by unleashing a very large and open opportunity for everybody to speak his mind on the planet was that it would cause a fundamental renegotiation of every existing power relationship that had been established up to that point. Since power is not just about force, it's about the capacity to use information to create a collective reality distortion field that doesn't admit the other possibilities. I mean, if you can get people asking the right questions, you don't have to worry about the answers. And for much of Western civilization, the right questions had been contained in one of three books. The great, the great monotheistic works had been very good at figuring out governance and authority by the simple method of having a great linear column with God on top and you on the bottom and a whole bunch of endowed by God authoritarians along that line of descent that were your natural governors. And I had a feeling, and I think it's been born true, that, that the internet was going to be very bad for monotheism. Uh, that it would, you know, by the, by the ability to admit into cultures a lot of questions that hadn't been asked before, and even insist on those questions in a way, that that there would be troubling answers that arose, and we now see the fruits of this uh, in many different areas, not in, not the least of which is first of all the era of awakening, and I want to deal with that a little further as we go along here, but. But also in the 
the vicious internecine conflicts that have been that have arisen between the three great monotheistic religions where instead of trying to kill the onrushing pantheists, which is us, they're trying to kill one another. Uh, which you would be pleased by were it not for the fact that, it, that they're large and we happen to be occupying the same battlefield whether we want to be there or not. Uh, but this is, is also an, a, the result of society dealing with an incursion of necessary anarchy. Necessary anarchy. But even within that anarchy, aside from the old boy network, there is, I think, the taxonomy of truth. And sorting out what is true, even though I think the, the means the means are at hand to do so. I also find that, that Mark Twain was right in saying that, that a lie could circle the planet three times while the truth was still getting its pants on. Uh, and the internet has definitely accelerated that uh, immeasurably. And so part of the anarchy that we have to deal with is the anarchy of, of intentional wrongheadedness and, and willful ignorance, which can can spread by the same miraculous means that can make its make its antidote over the long term. Uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation for many years found that the answer to maintaining the fundamentals that we were interested in went back to the fundamentals of those progenitors which was to recognize that architecture, the technical architecture of the internet was, in essence, its politics. And that there were countless little technical choices that could be made along the way that would either open the system or close the system or create throttle points for one, one established power source or another or, as been often the case, make it possible for those who believe that they have a natural right to own ideas to restrict them on that ground. And this has been a continuous struggle, but it's been simple in comparison to what I think is a, is a struggle that, that we are grappling with here at Burning Man, and that the people in the Arab Awakening are presently grappling with, and I think that the world will grapple with in many cases. It is easy enough to use the tools of, of anarchic expression to create a revolution, especially with this with this instantaneity uh, of organization that is suddenly is suddenly granted all of us. I mean, the the capacity of some combination of instant messaging and uh, and places of, of easy public gathering, whether it was Facebook, Twitter, or, or God knows what, have been the central drivers for the Arab Awakening. And I was, I've been fairly heavily involved with that whole process in terms of EFFs providing anonymity servers and proxy servers and technical methods of making it possible for people to go on communicating without the threat of being arrested and surveilled upon. Thanks. And it endowed them with the ability to create a revolution that is unprecedented in human history in that it is not lead, it, it is not led by demagogues. It is not led by by revolutionary zealots who can be wonderful for leading a revolution but tend to make shitty governors. And so they have been spared having these hotheads rise up to be the leaders that will that will take over from the, the nasty old way. But the problem is they don't know how to create a system of governance out of what was essentially an ungoverned revolution to begin with. It is very challenging to take the, the principles of bottom-up government and teach them overnight to people and institutions that have been trained to think that government comes from the top. Uh, this is a fundamental paradigm shift.
And even those of us who think that we like this deeply have a difficult time in every aspect of our being not resorting to that, you know, instantaneous, where's dad, whenever the going gets rough. Surely there's somebody who knows what's going on, he can help us with this. Well, often there isn't. Uh, and the fact that you think there is only makes matters worse. But in the, in the case of the Arab Awakening, there really, really isn't. And uh, I think, you know, we all need to be turn, turning our minds to figuring out how to deal with that problem. Now, that this gets me down to the, to the subject closer at hand. I want to talk about, about government, governance and Burning Man a little bit. The first year I came to Burning Man, I had a loaded 357 Magnum on the seat next to me. And the greeter looked at it and said, nice gun, and let me through. Things have changed. Now, I'm not saying that that was actually a standard that I would have wanted, wanted to continue as we got up to 50,000 people. I mean, I, and, and actually, the, in those days, there was a lot of fairly random gunplay that made it, you know, a very good thing that there was an awful lot of open space around here, which was part of the principle. But, <laughs> about that, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's been interesting to me as somebody who really loves the idea of self-regulatory human systems, watching what has happened here as this has grown and grown and, and come to include a lot of people that are not fundamentally in on the joke. I mean, in the very beginning, the only people out here were, I mean, it was, it was as if we had been born this way. We all knew what the deal was. And we were all perfectly willing to risk our lives. And we also had a, an innate trust in one another.